I love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story because I know it is true. It satisfies my longings as nothing else can do. I love to tell the story. Twill be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story, more wonderful it seems, than all the golden fancies of all my golden dreams. I love to tell the story, it did so much for me. And that is just the reason I tell it now to thee. I love to tell the story. I love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story because I know it is true. It satisfies my longings as nothing else can do. I love to tell the story Twill be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story, more wonderful it seems than all the golden fancies of all my golden dreams. I love to tell the story, it did so much for me, and that is just the reason I tell it now to thee. I love to tell the story, twill be my theme in glory, to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story, tis pleasant to repeat. What seems each time I tell it, more wonderfully sweet. I love to tell the story, for some have never heard the message of salvation from God's own holy word. I love to tell the story, twill be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story for those who know it best. Seem hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest. And when in scenes of glory I sing the new, new song. Twill be the old, old story that I have loved so long. I love to tell the story. Twill be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story 
of Jesus and his love. We're glad that you're here today. Welcome on behalf of Brother Stanley and myself. Uh, we continue in our basic Bible class. And today we're going to be talking about uh, from the textbook, the 10th and 11th cases of conversion. Uh, we touched on this a little earlier uh, in our studies, but uh, these are not necessarily the 10th and 11th uh, actual cases of conversion that we can read about uh, in the book of Acts. These are just the ones which the textbook uh, that we're using focuses on primarily because of their uh, relationship, especially uh, and discussing uh, how these individuals came uh, to be a part of the church that Jesus built. And so today we're talking about the church being established among the Corinthians and the Ephesians. Last week in our study, Paul had left the area of Troas and went up to uh, Philippi or Philippi, and there we were studying about Lydia and her household, the jailer, and the establishing of what came to be known as the Philippian church, for which we have a letter from the Apostle Paul in the New Testament. Now today we're going to be talking about Paul at Corinth in uh, this area of the world and also coming back over uh, to the city of Ephesus. And between Ephesus and Corinth and the time that the Apostle Paul spent in these places, we're looking at a period of about four and a half to five years that Paul uh, was active in this part of the world. Now, when we left off last week, uh, Paul was here among the Philippians. And if you read in the book of Acts, you'll find that Paul left the Philippian area uh, of Philippi and went down to Thessalonica, and there also he uh, was proclaiming the gospel of Christ, established the church there, and of course we have two letters to the church at Thessalonica in our New Testament. From there the apostle Paul went to Berea, preaching and teaching the gospel, and then he came down into Athens. Now, we're going to spend a lot of time about that. Hopefully, in the future, uh, we can go back and study the book of Acts in more detail. But today, as Paul leaves Athens, he goes into the city of Corinth, where he was there approximately 18 months preaching and teaching the gospel. And likewise, we have two letters, First and Second Corinthians, which were, which were written uh, to the church there. And we learn quite a bit about the church from what the Apostle Paul has to say uh, to the Corinthians. And so this morning, we're going to begin uh, our study uh, from the book of Acts, chapter 18, verse 1 through 3, and this will help us to uh, get an idea of a timeline that we're looking at. We're told that after the things which had transpired in Athens, Paul departed there and he came to the city of Corinth. And as he entered into the city, he found a certain Jew by the name of Aquila, who was born in Pontus. Uh, lately, he had arrived there at Corinth 
from Rome. Uh, and the reason that he was at Corinth and had left Rome is we're told that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart uh, from Rome. Now, Claudius uh, was in Rome about 41 to 54 A.D. And later on, we're going to get a, a, another date. We can pull another date out. And so we're not looking at the earlier part of Claudius' reign, but we're looking toward the latter part. And so somewhere around 50 AD, and we'll see why we're looking at that date. And so when Paul arrives at Corinth, the church has been established, uh, being established in 33 AD. Uh, it's almost been 20 years since the church was established. And so if you're trying to figure out from Acts, the second chapter up until about this time, uh, we're looking at approximately 20 years. And so when Paul came into the city of Corinth, uh, being a Jew, uh, he began to look for those of like faith, like background, which he had some things in common as a starting point uh, with the gospel. And he found there this man, uh, Aquila, and his wife Priscilla, and were told that he abode with them because they were of the same craft. Uh, they uh, worked in the manufacturing of tents. They were tent makers. And so at this time, uh, there were various needs. A lot of times people used small tents uh, for traveling. Uh, and if they had a means which to travel, they would carry with them these tents to give them additional protection from uh, the elements. And so uh, making tents and repairing tents, uh, also this uh, concept of tents, the tents were made uh, out of animal skins, uh, leather, and because uh, you had to learn to work with leather. And so uh, tent makers also were able to make satchels, what today we would think of as uh, purchase, uh, purses or carrying bags. They were able to uh, make everything from shoelaces, sandal laces, uh, working with the soles of shoes. And so it was much more elaborate probably than just the making of tents, but he worked with them. He joined himself to them and they worked together because they were of a like craft and had backgrounds uh, in the Jewish faith. And I want to emphasize here the fact that when the apostle Paul came to Corinth, uh, he was not only looking uh, for a place to preach the gospel, but he worked there. I, I can't emphasize this enough. Every preacher needs to learn a trade. They need to have a skill. Uh, preaching is an occupation, yes, in and of itself. But many preachers try to rely on someone else to support them. The Apostle Paul was a preacher. He was an apostle, but he also worked to make a living, to provide for himself and others. And I keep saying this, preachers need to have an occupation that they can engage in to meet their needs and also the needs of the congregation. We've kind of developed to a point today where we think that the congregation or someone else ought to take care of us. But Paul, as we look at these things, 
uh, most definitely sets an example to us uh, of what it means to be a religious leader uh, and again to have a means of the work, supporting the work uh, with their hands. And so this is what we find there. So Paul arrives at Athens and we're or rather at Corinth. And in verse four, we find that he entered into the synagogue, every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and Greeks. This is as Paul's actions normally were. When he came into a city, he was looking to see if it had a group of Jews. And if there were a group of Jews, there was usually a synagogue or at least some type of assembly, as we saw uh, with Lydia and her household at Philippi. Here at Corinth, there was a large enough community that they had a synagogue of the Jews. Paul, being a Pharisee, had access to the synagogue and would have been seen in the eyes of the people there, not as an apostle, but as a rabbi or a teacher. And as a traveling teacher, he would have had an opportunity to speak to the congregation there in the synagogue. And in the synagogue, of course, Paul would find primarily Jews who had an understanding of the old law, which was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. They had the scrolls with the writings, both of Moses and the prophets, which he could use to persuade individuals such as Berea there when Paul was preaching and teaching at Berea. We're told they searched the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. And those scriptures, of course, being the Old Testament with those 300 and some prophecies concerning Jesus. And also in the synagogue, because uh, many Greeks were interested in the things of God, there were Greeks, Gentiles, who also would come to the synagogues to pay tribute and worship God also. And so some of the Greeks, the Gentiles, had learned about the Messiah and learned about the things of God. And so Paul had an opportunity to speak to the Jews. And also when he was not in the synagogue, he also had an opportunity through these Gentiles to reach out to others that were in the community. And this is keeping with what Paul said in Romans 1.16, that the gospel is to the Jew first and also the Greek. And he follows that pattern uh, of going into a city, looking for Jews, going into the synagogue, reasoning with the Jews, persuading them that Jesus of Nazareth was the Christ or the Messiah. And along with that came some of the Gentiles also uh, who were open to the things that Paul was saying. And so in verse 5, it says, And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, uh, there in the areas of Berea, Thessalonica, Philippi, these different <laughs> places, we're told that Paul was pressed or he was further motivated in the spirit to testify to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And so Paul began to even emphasize much more so in dealing with the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah that they had uh, been looking for. But in the process of his speaking and teaching, uh, the Jews there in the synagogue, we find that there came opposition. 
You know, at first, Paul is preaching and teaching to the Jews and some of the Gentiles that Jesus of Nazareth was the Christ. And all people at the beginning uh, were willing to listen. But as time went on, just like in many other places, some Jews were willing to accept that Jesus was the Christ. Other Jews were not willing to accept Jesus was the Christ. And since the synagogue belonged to the Jewish people, when opposition started uh, among the Jewish people, remember the Jewish synagogue wasn't a church. Many churches started in the synagogues, but because of those who opposed uh, the preaching of Jesus as the Messiah, those who were Christians were forced to uh, leave the synagogues and seek other places where they might worship. And so in verse 6, we see that there was opposition that arose. And in the midst of that, uh, we're told that among these Jewish opposers, uh, they begin to blaspheme and speak evil about the things of Jesus. Now, this is most definitely not what the Apostle Paul wanted to accomplish. He did not want to be in an assembly of people who were blaspheming the, the things that he was teaching. And so we're told, as was a custom uh, among the Jewish people, even as Jesus told his disciples on the limited commission when he sent them around, uh, he shook his raiment. He knocked the dust off his feet, so to speak, and he told them, your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth, I go unto the Gentiles. And we need to understand what Paul was saying here. Paul was not abandoning every Jew everywhere for all time. Sadly, some preachers have misunderstood what Paul said and have literally created a doctrine that said from this point on, Paul abandoned the Jews for the Gentiles. And that's not true. Uh, we find Paul continuing to speak to the Jews first and also the Greeks. What he is saying applies specifically here to the synagogue, which was there at Corinth. Paul is basically telling them, I came here to share with you the gospel of Christ. I came here to tell you that the Messiah has come. And since you oppose that, and because you have chosen to blaspheme the things which I'm saying, your blood, your soul, your eternity, your decision is your own. But I will henceforth uh, turn and spend his emphasis now upon the Greeks or the Gentiles of that city. He did, as he said in the Romans, he had preached the gospel first to the Jew and given them an opportunity to be saved and now, uh, when the leadership of the synagogue uh, begins to oppose him, he moves on. Now, it's interesting, uh, here at Corinth, excuse me, let me get back where I need to be. Uh, we're told that he departed thence, that is not from Corinth, but he left the synagogue. And we're told he entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshiped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. In many of these cities, buildings were literally built right up against each other. Uh, just like in major cities today, they take advantage of every single inch of space 
to build. It's spaces of a prime uh, value within a city. And it's interesting that one of the Jews who Paul had been speaking with by the name of Justice, uh, his house was butted up to, literally built against the synagogue. And he has Paul come into his house, and there Paul preaches the gospel. And so it's interesting for the Jews who are coming to the synagogue, uh, again, they will be worshiping. But when people say that there is this man preaching next to the synagogue, Everyone knows the location, and so it's easy for them uh, to find uh, the church, if you want to call it that now, that is in the city of Corinth. And that church, at least at the first, was in this man's house who worshipped God. He was uh, one who worshipped God. And he opened his house uh, to uh, the establishment there of the church. Now, in the process of time, verse 8, we're told that Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all of his house. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. As we look at this uh, area here, uh, as time went on, and remember, we're talking about 18 months, about a year and a half, that the Apostle Paul is working uh, there in Corinth, preaching and teaching the gospel. Mm -hmm. There is this man by the name of Crispus, and we're told he was the chief ruler of the synagogue. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that he was in charge or like an elder over everyone there. Generally speaking, the ruler of the synagogue was the one who was charged with maintaining and making sure that the synagogue was prepared and in order for the worship of God through uh, the uh, every Sabbath as well as the high holy days in which uh, they worshiped. And there may have been some special uh, considerations, special uh, arrangements to be made. So Crispus was in charge of preparing, setting up, uh, making sure that the synagogue was maintained and ready. Uh, and so uh, there again, he had been worshiping in the synagogue, but he came to learn uh, of the things of Jesus through the Apostle Paul, along with all of his house. Uh, and not only that, but many of those in Corinth hearing uh, the gospel proclaimed by Paul uh, here in the house of justice and throughout the city believe concerning the fact that Jesus of Nazareth was the Christ, the Messiah, and believing they were baptized. And this is the thing that we have learned, whether it's at Philippi or whether it's at uh, the city of Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, the book of Acts shows us that when the gospel was preached to individuals, those that gladly received the word, that is, who believed the things concerning Jesus Christ, were baptized for the remission of their sins, Acts 2 and verse 38. I just have this uh, item here I put on there to understand about the ruler of the synagogue. Uh, and here it says, the ruler of the synagogue was a man chosen 
to care for the physical arrangements of the synagogue services. Uh, today, among synagogues, they would be referred to as the president uh, of the synagogue in caring, preparing, and making <clears throat> arrangements. Uh, continuing on, then spake the Lord to Paul in the night uh, by vision, be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. God knows the hearts of individuals, and he knows where people are going to be more receptive to the truth. He knows people who are genuinely interested in the things of God versus those who are just going through the motions. And so as Paul progresses and as he's teaching and as people are believing and, and being baptized into Christ, the church is growing. And no doubt it brought some conflict between the Jewish synagogue and those who were uh, there at Crispus' house. Uh, but uh, as this conflict continued to grow and as more people heard the word, the Lord appears to Paul. I'm sure Paul started thinking, you know, much like uh, Philippi, much like Thessalonica, much like other places. Uh, he had literally been run out of town. The Lord appears to him here saying, Paul, it's, it's not going to be uh, like it has been in some other places. And I have much people here. And don't be uh, leery of preaching and teaching. And so Paul accomplished a great deal in that year and a half among both the Jews and the Gentiles there in that city. And so for a year and six months, he was teaching and preaching the word of God among them. Uh, we're told uh, as time went on uh, that Gallio uh, was a deputy in Achaia and this would have been somewhere around 53 A.D., the Jews made insurrection with one accord against Paul and brought him uh, into the judgment seat. So for about a year and a half, Paul was preaching and teaching, and things were going well. But there was a change uh, in the leadership and essence in the city, uh, of Corinth, and when he was deputy of the city uh, around 53 AD, uh, the Jews, seeing an opportunity, uh, as many times they did, uh, challenged Paul. They brought him to court. Uh, they apparently did not believe that whoever was in charge prior to this uh, would have taken their side. But for whatever reason, uh, they believe that this new individual trying to win favor uh, might be willing to hear a case against the Apostle Paul. And so they brought charges against him, brought him uh, to the judgment seat, to court in essence. They sued him, as we would think today. And their statement was, this fellow, uh, Paul, persuadeth men to worship God contrary to the law. And so they charged him that he was teaching things that uh, was not uh, according to law. Now, the interesting thing is uh, they just make that statement. They don't say according to the law of God. They don't say according to the law of Caesar they just say the charge is he's teaching things that are contrary to the law. And so because of that, uh, he is willing, therefore, uh, to hear what they have to say. 
And uh, as we look there, it says uh, Paul was about uh, that he listened. Um, we, we have to understand uh, Gallio listened to the things that the Jews and the charges that they were making. And then Paul was about to enter his defense against the charges that they were making. But uh, we're told that Gallio uh, addressed the Jews after hearing what they were talking about in more detail. And he says, if it were a matter of wrong or wicked lewdness, O ye Jews, reason would I, uh, that uh, reason would that I should bear with you. After having listened to uh, the things that were being said, he comes to realize that the law that they're talking about is not the law of Caesar, but it's the law of God. And so he says uh, to the Jews, you know, this is a civil court in essence. And if it was a matter of the fact that he had broken the law of Caesar, or if it was some wickedness, lewdness, I would continue to listen to what you have to say. But he realizing that it wasn't, he says, if it be a question of words and names and of your law, look ye to it, for I will be no judge of such matters. He tells the Jews that, you know, he is there as a leader of civil authority. And what they're talking about has nothing to do with civil law. And if you're all just arguing over who is or who is not the Messiah, and that's words, you know, that if you're talking about titles and words and Savior and not Savior, Messiah, not Messiah. You know, if you're talking about what your uh, religious law has to say, I'm not going to get in the middle of all of that. And so we're told that he drove them from the judgment seat. He put them out. He said, I, I'm refusing to hear what you're trying to bring forth. Now, uh, we're told uh, then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat, and Gallio cared for none of those things. So again, uh, there was a, a blowback, if you will, in this. But uh, they did not get the leader there in the city involved in their conflict. Now, it's interesting that Sosthenes, we're told, was one who the Greeks took, uh, and they punished for what was going on. And when Paul writes to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 1, the letter there is addressed Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so we see Sosthenes is traveling with the Apostle Paul later on when he writes uh, this epistle to the church. And so he also is one who is a part of the body there at Corinth. As just a few things here about the church at Corinth. I'm sure most of you are aware of it, but we do know in the course of time, after Paul had left, there arose uh, divisions even among the church, and we can learn some things 
from those divisions. Paul says, now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. As we look at the religious world today, we see great division. We see divisions over names, doctrines, teachings. Uh, a lot of people say it's good that we have all these denominations, all these religious groups. It gives people a choice. Uh, but what the Apostle Paul tells us about divisions or what we would call denominations is that we need to be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Everyone everywhere who calls on the Lord needs to be united together in the same mind and in the same judgment. The New Testament does not teach hundreds of different ways. It only speaks to the church that Jesus built and to the worship and service of those whom the Bible calls Christians. Now, Paul is troubled uh, in all of this that he's been told that there were contentions. Contentions uh, end up making denominations. People don't see eye to eye. They're not joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment some people refuse to do what uh, they've been told. One person thinks one thing is as good as another, and before long, there are contentions. And uh, Paul says that there were those there. Some said, I am of Paul. Others said, I am of Apollos. Others of Cephas, that is Peter, and others of Christ. And so we see all these divisions. We see Paulites, Apollosites, we see Cephasites, uh, Christians. Uh, we see the early signs that Christianity can and will divide up even over good men and cause contentions. Uh, and Paul says, is Christ divided? And the answer to that is no. Was Paul crucified for you? No. And therefore, no church should bear the name of a man who didn't save them from their sins. Were you baptized in the name of Paul? No. Uh, it was not under the authority of Paul, but it was under, as Jesus said, the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And one of the things that he says there is, I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus. That's one of the ones we were just looking at. And Gaius, lest any should say that I have baptized in my own name. Now, once again, many have looked at this and said, well, again, Paul didn't baptize. He was glad that he didn't baptize. The fact was he himself did not do the immersions, the baptisms, but we do know that those hearing and believing were baptized. Paul is not arguing against baptism, but he is arguing about the fact that people tend to put more trust in those who are preaching and teaching to them. And if they don't do it appropriately, it can cause divisions. So again, Paul is not saying we don't need to be baptized. Paul is saying you need to understand in whose name you're being baptized. And that's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Or you're baptized in the authority or the name of Christ. You should be a Christian. That's all you need to be, and you need to be joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. We have a list here uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians 6 that just shows us uh, what some of the people were like there in Corinth. Uh, we see that there were there 
fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate abusers of themselves with mankind, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners. These are the ones Paul said they were washed, they were sanctified, they were justified in the name, here we're back to this, in the name of the Lord Jesus. And that's who we're baptized into. That's the authority. And we ought to be Christians and Christians only. And that's enough based on the word of God. And uh, later on, we're, we're again going to need to move on. But as we're thinking about the church at Corinth, Paul says, uh, these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes. Notice what he says, that you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written. One of the biggest problems in Christianity today is that people put their trust in men, and yes, sometimes women, who lead them and teach them and instruct them in ways different, causing contentions and divisions. And Paul says we ought to be perfectly joined together. And the cure for that and the way for that that we learn in the conversion and the church there at Corinth is not to think of men or women or anyone else. Paul later on says, even an angel from heaven, uh, if they preach any other gospel to you than that which you have received, that which is written, uh, don't go beyond uh, the word of God. So with that, uh, we have the establishment of the church at Corinth. We know that it grew. We know that Paul wrote a couple letters to them. From there, he moves back to Ephesus, where we see him preaching and teaching for uh, the next three years uh, in this process. And so we're told in Acts 19, it came to pass that while Paulus was still at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and he found certain disciples there. And he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Now we've seen this before, such as with the teaching of Philip. There were evangelists and those who were going out preaching and teaching uh, the gospel establishing churches, but they did not have the ability of the apostles to lay their hands on individuals and impart to them the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so Paul, finding some disciples here at Ephesus, asked them if, in essence, an apostle has been there to lay hands on them since they believed, since they hearing the word, believed the word, were baptized uh, into Christ. And they said unto him, we have not heard, or we have not so much as heard whether they be any Holy Ghost. Well, now that's kind of strange. If you're a Christian, if you're a disciple of Christ, surely you know the, the Holy Spirit and so this seems strange and odd to the Apostle Paul. We have people who are uh, talking about the kingdom of heaven or disciples. And, and so he asks them, unto what then were you baptized? And they said unto him, John's baptism. Ah, that explains it. John came preaching and teaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, saying that they ought to believe on him that should come afterward. But Paul realizes if that's all that they understand, that means they've never really heard the full gospel of Christ, and they have not been baptized 
into Christ. And so he talks about John's baptism, uh, that uh, they should believe on him that would come after. And so Paul preaches to them Jesus. And we're told when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They were disciples of John. And after being taught the truth of the gospel, they were baptized into Christ. They became disciples of Christ. They became Christians. And so that's what we see uh, taking place here. And this uh, at Ephesus brings up an important question to us in the church today. Should believers who have been baptized for other reasons be baptized again after learning the truth of the gospel as revealed in the New Testament? A lot of people today says that if someone has been baptized, that's enough. But is it? We see these believers at Ephesus had been baptized, but they had been baptized in the baptism of John and not the baptism of Christ. We find disciples today, we find individuals who have been taught about Jesus and believe that he is a savior and he can save them from their sins, but they have been taught in error by those in the midst of the denominational world who have shown to them a different gospel. Maybe they've taught them that as alien sinners, they should pray for their sins and that they were forgiven. Some denominations teach that you don't have to be baptized at all. Some teach if you want to be baptized, you can be. Others teach that while you're baptized, you may be sprinkled or poured or immersed. And so there's all kinds of teachings uh, about both Christianity and uh, baptism. And so if someone has been baptized as the, by that term, and they are taught the truth of the church that Jesus built, of true Christianity as reflected in the New Testament, if they've not been baptized for the remission of sins, should they be baptized again? And the answer is yes. Because these disciples who were baptized with the baptism of John, when they learned the truth, were baptized for the remission of sins in the name of the Lord. Just any baptism is not enough. We have to be baptized for the right reasons, and we have to be baptized in the right way. Now, I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail. Our time is running out today, but I want us to understand that lots of people use the word baptize, sprinkling and pouring all the same way. And those are not the same Greek words. The New Testament clearly speaks of baptism as being an immersion. It is not sprinkling. It's not pouring. The word itself literally means to be immersed. And so if someone has been taught they needed to be baptized and then someone sprinkled them or poured water over their head, uh, that's not the definition of baptism. And again, these individuals need to be immersed in a watery grave of baptism for the remission of sins. And so when Paul was finished, we see the start of the church there at Ephesus, verse 7. There were about 12 men there. 
And so likewise, he went into the synagogue and for a space of about three months, he was disputing and persuading individuals who came to the synagogue that Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah. But likewise, eventually, sides were drawn. Some believed that Jesus was the Messiah. Some believed that he wasn't. And so, just like at Corinth, Paul separates himself from uh, these Jews that are non-believers in Christ. And he goes into a school of one Tyrannius, and there he uses that school as a place where he may daily preach and teach the things of Jesus. Now, we have some people today that say that, uh, again, there shouldn't be anything but the church, and we can't uh, have Bible schools, we can't have preaching schools, we can't have colleges, we don't believe in those kind of things. Well, here's a perfect example that that concept is wrong also, because the Apostle Paul went into this school, which was not a church, it was a school, and there in that school, he was preaching and teaching on a daily basis that Jesus was the Christ. And so he continued there for a space of two years. And so later on, we find out that the Apostle Paul was there for a space of three years, Acts 20, where he was preaching and teaching both day and night. And he also says, much like at Corinth, ye yourselves know that these hands, that's the hands of Paul, ministered unto my necessities. I worked for my living and also for them who were with me. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring, working, earning a living, ye ought to support the weak. Preachers need to earn a living and work with their hands uh, in order that they can give to the less fortunate. Preachers shouldn't be the less fortunate. Preachers ought to be working and making a living, whether that's being a fisherman, a carpenter, whether it's being a tent maker, a, whatever it is. We ought to make a living to support uh, those who are needed so that as we can see even in 1 Corinthians 16, on the first day of the week, every one of us, and that includes preachers, can lay by in store as God has prospered them so that when there is a need, that need can be addressed. Uh, the church should not live in poverty, but it ought to be a place where people come together and work uh, to support that. And remembering the words of Jesus, it's uh, there. It is more blessed to give than to receive. And again, preachers ought to be givers as well as, yes, occasionally receiving. In Ephesians 3, Paul speaks in his letter there, saying that when they read this letter, they may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Friends, we ought to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Uh, inside the New Testament is revealed the mystery of Christ, what God wants of us, expects of us, as we worship him in spirit and in truth, and as we live uh, soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. And through studying the scriptures, we come to know and to understand that great mystery of Christ, which once was not known unto the sons of men, but now has been revealed to these inspired writers by the Holy Spirit. 
And in so we ought to be endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. That's exactly what Paul told the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 1 and 10. Because there is only one body, that's one church, one spirit, the Holy Spirit. There is only one hope of our calling, and that is to live with the Lord, to ever be with him in heaven. There is only one Lord. There is only one faith, and that's the Christian faith. There is only one baptism, and that is for the remission of sins in the name of Jesus Christ being immersed. There is one God and Father of all, and he is above all, through all, and in you all. And so the power of Paul's preaching and teaching there uh, at Ephesus is seen uh, in uh, Acts 19 when we're told that many of those who used curious arts, witchcraft and divination, many of these things, black arts, uh, they brought their books together and burned them before all men. How do we know that these people repented of their sins? They brought their books, which contain the teachings of these doctrines, contrary to Jesus of Nazareth, and they burned them to destroy them so that they would not be able to influence others. And so great was the destruction of these things that we're told that they counted what would be the cost of procuring and having these books and we're told that they found it to be 50,000 pieces of silver. Now, I, in the block here, uh, I checked this morning to see what the cost of silver was so we could have an idea today of what we're talking about. If each of those pieces of silver were only about a half ounce each, it would be $118,750 today, heading towards three quarters of a million dollars. And so there indeed was a great movement through the preaching and teaching of the gospel by the Apostle Paul there. And literally, it is true when it says in verse 20, so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed, that we can see such things as this taking place. And again, uh, there arose uh, conflicts about that way. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me through the Lord Jesus and through Christianity. And so eventually those who were selling uh, little figurines of the idols there in the city began to see their income, their wealth decay, uh, that Paul's preaching was having an impact on that. Uh, and so throughout Asia, Paul, we're told, hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying, there be no gods which are made with hands. And so Paul had preached mightily about that to the point that the temple there at Ephesus of the great goddess Diana uh, would again become despised. People were turning away from the worship of that, causing problems for them and for the worship of Diana. And of course, here's a, one picture of a statue of Diana, the same as the Greek goddess Artemis. Uh, she was in their pagan religion, the goddess of wild animals and hunting. And again, it was her temple that people uh, were seen uh, abandoning, uh, not maybe in its entirety, but by today, the worship of this goddess indeed 
uh, has uh, been destroyed primarily through the preaching and teaching of Christianity among all of those who dwell uh, throughout the world. As we begin to bring things to a close this morning, uh, Paul reminds the church at Ephesus that we ought to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Trust in God. Trust in his word. Put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand against the wiles or the schemes of the devil. Because we don't wrestle just with flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, rulers of darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places. It's not just a battle of flesh and blood, my friends, but it's about the souls of individuals where they will spend eternity. I just put this up, you know, put it there so you can have it, but We've all seen this, the Roman soldier that the Apostle Paul uses as an example of putting on the whole armor of God. Uh, as he talks about, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of the faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Let us not grow weary in well-doing. Uh, we shall prevail if we faint not. Let us learn from the examples of the Apostle Paul to challenge false doctrines, divisions, idolatry, the worship of things called gods, but do not have the power, the ability to save. There is only the one way, and that way is the way of Jesus Christ as revealed in the New Testament. All right, the end of lesson 20, there are 25 questions. Uh, we encourage you to get that answered and in. If you're doing the certificate course, get that taken care of by Friday of this week so you'll be ready to study and prepare for next week's lesson. We're going to open it up to questions in a moment, but before we do, let's have a word of prayer. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we come before your throne of grace. We're thankful for this day, this opportunity to share to learn from these cases of conversion and all that surrounds them, the New Testament, that we might be faithful, Father, faithful servants in your kingdom, that we might preach and teach your word so that those who are lost may come to know you and your son, be saved from their sins, live, love, and serve you, that when this life is over, heaven can be our home. Be with us, Father, through this week. Be with all of those who are in need of your hand. Watch over us. Keep us in your care. And return us back again at our next opportunity. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. And amen. In closing this evening, we wish to thank you again for spending your time in study with us. We hope the lesson has been uplifting and motivational. We encourage you to return again for our next lesson. Until then, may we invite you to visit our website. You will find many study opportunities. Our resource page has links to the Gospel Broadcasting Network, a 24-7 station with many great Christian programs and speakers. In Search of the Lord's Way, with Brother Phil Sanders. We have two links for Bibles and downloadable software. If you are looking to really expand your knowledge, perhaps you might like to try World Video Bible School, a college-level learning site free of charge. So, until next time. May God bless and keep you in His care as we walk together in His truth. And remember as always, the Churches of Christ salute you.